Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're diving into a really fascinating area, uh, cancer of unknown primary. CUP. CUP, exactly. Yeah. Short and to the point. Yes. And it's a bit of a medical mystery, you know? Right. We find these cancer cells, but the origin, like the starting point, mm -hmm. is unknown. Mm -hmm. So it's like finding... Um, you know, a footprint, but having no idea what creature made it. That's a great analogy. Yeah, so we've got a lot of information here, a lot of material to go through. We've got research articles, we've got medical records, even some personal stories from patients. And we're hoping to use all of this to kind of help you guys out there make sense of this, this complex diagnosis, you know, mm -hmm. whether you're facing CUP personally or you're just curious about it, we're going to break it down. Yeah. So what I find really interesting about CUP is it's like a puzzle. Right? It is. But some of the pieces are missing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really great way to put it. It's like we know the cancer is there, but we're trying to figure out, you know, where it came from, where did it start. Right. So that makes both diagnosis and treatment so much more challenging, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. You're going in a little bit blind. Yeah. So let's just start with some basics. How common is CUP? And what are some of the reasons that... Um, a primary tumor might remain hidden. So CUP is actually relatively rare. It affects less than 1% of people who are diagnosed with cancer each year. Wow, okay. Yeah, and there are several reasons why that original um, primary tumor might stay hidden. Sometimes it's just really, really small. Okay. So small that it's basically undetectable with our current imaging technology, like trying to find a needle in a haystack, but the needle's microscopic. So it's like hiding in plain sight. What are some other reasons it might be undetectable? Well, sometimes the primary tumor might have actually been destroyed by the body's immune system. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's done its job, you know, gotten rid of the threat. But then we're left with just the metastases, the spreading cancer cells. It's like um, the immune system cleaned up the crime scene. Wow. So our bodies could be winning a battle we don't even know about. Yeah, exactly. And another scenario is that the primary tumor might have been removed unknowingly during a previous surgery. So let's say you had surgery for something completely unrelated. Right. The tumor could have been there and it was taken out, but nobody knew it at the time. So it's like you accidentally threw away a key piece of evidence without realizing it. Okay, that makes sense. But let's talk about the signs. What should people be aware of, especially when it comes to CUP? Yeah, that's where things get a little bit tricky because CUP often presents with very general symptoms, things like unexplained pain, persistent fatigue, unintentional weight loss. Okay, so very general. Yeah, unfortunately, these symptoms are common to a lot of different conditions, so it can be really hard to pinpoint CUP early on. So it's like an alarm going off, but you don't know which sensor triggered it. Exactly, yeah. And because these symptoms are so nonspecific, people might just dismiss them, you know, as everyday aches and pains. And that can delay diagnosis and potentially allow the cancer to progress further. That's really concerning. Is there anything like specific people should watch for? Any combination of symptoms that might warrant um, immediate attention? Well, I would say any persistent and unexplained symptoms should always be checked out by a doctor. But one particular red flag for CUP is the combination of persistent pain in a specific area, unexplained weight loss, and night sweats. If you experience all three of those together, it's really crucial to seek medical attention right away. Okay, good to know. Now let's talk about the diagnostic journey. I imagine this can be a long and winding road for CUP patients. Absolutely. Yeah, you're exactly right. Diagnosing CUP is like putting together a complex puzzle. And each test, you know, each test result gives us another piece of that picture. Usually the journey starts with a thorough medical history review and a physical exam. Okay, so after that initial evaluation... Then what happens? Well, doctors will typically order blood and urine analyses to look for any abnormalities that might be a sign of a problem. But to really get to the bottom of things, more specialized tests are going to be needed. Okay, so what kind of specialized tests are we talking about? So biopsies are absolutely crucial in CUP cases. By examining a small sample of the cancerous tissue under a microscope, doctors can figure out the type of cancer and rule out any known primary sites. So it helps narrow down the possibilities. Exactly, yeah. And imaging scans like CT scans, MRI, and PT scans are also essential tools. They help pinpoint where the cancer has spread and how far it's gone. So think of them as high-tech maps guiding the diagnostic process. 
I see. So it's all about gathering as much information as possible. Exactly. What about procedures like endoscopies? I've heard those can be helpful in certain cases. Yeah, endoscopies are sometimes necessary, especially if those initial tests haven't given a clear answer. Hmm. And they allow doctors to actually view the inside of organs so they can further investigate potential origins. It sounds like a very thorough but potentially overwhelming process. It can be, yeah. How can patients navigate this diagnostic odyssey without, you know, feeling lost and confused? That's a great question. Having a strong support system is key. You know, having people to talk to, people to help you through this, yeah. and really open communication with your healthcare providers. Those are both so important for staying informed and empowered, you know, feeling like you're part of the process. Right, not just along for the ride. Exactly. Okay, great. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be right back with more on Cancer of Unknown Primary. And, you know, it can feel overwhelming, this whole diagnostic process for CUP. But understanding the process can really empower you. Like I was saying before, it's kind of like assembling a jigsaw puzzle. Mm. You may not have the box lid showing the complete picture, but each test result, it brings you closer to identifying the right pieces. So while it can be frustrating not having all the answers immediately, the key is to really focus on gathering that information. Exactly. And in addition to the biopsies and imaging that we talked about earlier, there's another tool that plays a crucial role in diagnosing CUP, and that's tumor marker tests. These tests, they measure the levels of certain substances in your blood that can be associated with specific types of cancer. So if a particular tumor marker is elevated, could that point like directly to the origin of the cancer? It can give us some really valuable clues, mm -hmm. but it's not always a definitive answer, unfortunately. Yeah. Some tumor markers can be elevated even in people who don't have cancer, Okay. while others might not be elevated even when a specific cancer is present. It's like all part of this big, intricate puzzle we're trying to solve. So it's like real detective work, right? Analyzing all these clues and trying to make the connections. It really is. And uh, speaking of detective work, one of the ways doctors try to determine the potential primary site is by really looking at carefully analyzing the pattern of where the cancer has spread. So, for instance, if the cancer is primarily found above the diaphragm, it might suggest that it originated in the lungs or the breast. Okay, that makes sense, like working backwards from the evidence. Precisely. And in recent years, advanced genetic and molecular testing has really revolutionized how we approach CUP. Yeah, imagine being able to read the cancer's blueprint. Okay. That's essentially what these tests allow us to do. By analyzing the DNA and RNA of the cancer cells, doctors can sometimes pinpoint the origin even when other methods have failed. So it's like finding that one missing puzzle piece. Yes, that suddenly makes everything clearer. And these tests can also reveal specific genetic mutations or weaknesses in the cancer that can be targeted with very personalized therapies. Wow. It's like um, having a guided missile zeroing in on the enemy's weak spot. So even though CUP is, you know, shrouded in this mystery, we can still learn a lot about it and um, fight back strategically. Absolutely. Access to these advanced diagnostic tools really empowers both patients and doctors, especially when you're facing such a complex diagnosis. So now let's talk about treatment. Knowing that CUP presents you know, such unique challenges, how do doctors even approach creating a treatment plan, especially when the primary site might remain unknown? Well, individualization is key. You know, treatment plans for CUP are really carefully tailored to each person, taking into account things like the suspected origin, the patient's overall health, their personal preferences, and, you know, the extent of the disease. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Definitely not. While those standard cancer treatments like surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and hormone therapy are still really important, the cornerstones of treatment, you know? The specific combination and how we sequence those therapies is really carefully considered for each individual case. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit on how those standard treatments might be used in CUP? Sure. So surgery is sometimes an option, particularly if the metastases are localized and accessible. Okay. And the goal there is to remove as much of that cancerous tissue as possible. Radiation therapy, which uses high energy rays, to really target specific areas where the cancer has spread. And then uh, chemotherapy utilizes drugs to really combat those cancer cells throughout the body, aiming to shrink tumors, slow the cancer's growth, and you know alleviate those troublesome symptoms. And then we have hormone therapy, which works by blocking or reducing the effects of hormones that can fuel certain types of cancer. 
that's a lot to process. Yeah. Is there a way for patients to kind of stay informed and involved in these treatment decisions? Absolutely. Open communication with your healthcare team is really paramount. Yeah. You know, don't hesitate to ask questions, risk <laughs> concerns, seek clarification about your diagnosis, treatment options, and potential side effects. You yeah. know, knowledge is power. And really being actively involved in your care can make a world of difference. Right. So feeling empowered in that process. Yes. That's really good advice. Now, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the emotional and psychological impact of living with CUP. Okay. I can only imagine, you know, the, the uncertainty surrounding the origin just adds another layer of complexity to an already very challenging experience. Mm -hmm. It does. You know, CUP often brings this heightened sense of fear and anxiety because not knowing where the cancer started or why can feel like this constant weight on your shoulders. Many patients really struggle with feelings of helplessness, loss of control, and even sometimes guilt. So it sounds incredibly isolating. What resources are available for patients to kind of navigate these emotional challenges? Well, I think building a strong support network is absolutely crucial. This could involve leaning on family and friends, maybe joining a support group specifically for CUP patients, or even seeking guidance from a mental health professional who specializes in cancer care. You know, remember, you don't have to go through this alone. That's very true. Earlier, we talked about um, the benefits of genetic testing for CUP. What are your thoughts on the potential emotional impact of those results on patients? Well, you know, genetic testing can be a very powerful tool, but it's important to approach it with both optimism and a little bit of caution. On one hand, getting a clearer answer about the cancer's origin, you know, it can provide a sense of relief and validation. It can help patients feel a bit more in control, like, okay, we finally have a starting point, a foundation to build on. Right. It's not this complete unknown anymore. Exactly. But on the other hand, Genetic testing can also sometimes raise concerns about potential inherited cancer risks, mm -hmm. not just for the patient, but also for their family members. And that can lead to some really complex emotions and some difficult decisions. So it's kind of a double-edged sword in a way. It can be, yeah. That's why genetic testing should always, always be accompanied by really comprehensive genetic counseling. Great. A genetic counselor can help patients really understand those test results, what they mean, discuss potential implications for themselves and their loved ones, and help them make those informed decisions about their health care and, you know, future family planning. It's not just about the science. It's also about the human impact. Right. And making sure that patients really have the support that they need throughout this entire process. Exactly. And that's why I think a multidisciplinary approach to cancer care is so important. You know, ideally, CUP patients should have access to like a whole team of specialists working together to provide this comprehensive, compassionate care. Mm -hmm. Oncologists, surgeons, radiologists, pathologists, genetic counselors, mental health professionals all playing their part. That sounds like the ideal scenario. You yeah. know, a team of experts really supporting that patient every step of the way. Yes, absolutely. Now, before we wrap up, I want to circle back to um, the research aspect of all of this. Are there any promising developments on the horizon for CUP treatment? Absolutely. The field of cancer research is constantly evolving, and there's a lot of exciting work happening specifically for CUP. One area that's showing particular promise is immunotherapy. I've heard about that in other um cancer contexts. Yeah. Can you explain how it works and why it might be so promising for CUP? Sure. So immunotherapy essentially harnesses the power of your own immune system to fight the cancer. You know, it's kind of like giving your body's natural defenses a boost, helping them recognize and attack cancer cells more effectively. That sounds incredible. But how is immunotherapy being applied specifically to CUP, considering that, you know, we don't always know that primary site? Well, that's the exciting part. Researchers are developing new immunotherapy drugs that specifically target CUP cells based on their unique molecular profiles, regardless of the origin. It's like creating this customized weapon that can seek out and destroy CUP cells wherever they may be hiding. So that's that's really a game changer, right? That sounds like the future of CUP treatment is very bright with personalized medicine and these innovative approaches leading the way. It certainly is. And while we haven't completely solved the mystery of CUP, you know, we're making significant strides every day. New discoveries, innovative treatments, and ongoing research really offer a lot of hope and a path forward for patients who are facing this complex diagnosis. This has been an incredibly insightful deep dive into the world of CUP. Thank you so much for um, sharing your expertise and offering such valuable information for our listeners. It's been my pleasure. Really enjoyed it. And to everyone listening, thank you for joining us on this journey.